Welcome to OC Can You See, uh, brought to you by the CTV Society, also known as the Society for Economic Equality. Tonight, Hemp Health, Wealth, and Jobs for Michigan. A year ago, uh, or almost a year ago, uh, February of 2014, uh, a bill uh, sponsored through the Senate and also passing through the House uh, was signed here in Michigan uh, by the president uh, enacting a federal law which uh, for the first time in many decades has uh, allowed for the uh, widespread legal growing of uh, what is called industrial hemp uh, defined by the law as uh, something distinct from the controlled substance uh, marijuana and uh, apparently this material has many uses and one could say that uh, the fact that we are not running automobiles on it, making plastics from it, making textiles from it, making paper from it, making cattle feed from it, uh, uh, making uh, petrochemical uh, pharmaceuticals from this material is simply that years ago money was invested by powerful forces, corporate forces, in the fossil fuel economy. At this point, uh, the major problem that humanity seems to face is the result of that fossil fuel economy and its devastating impact on the environment, the climate. And uh, so tonight, we're here specifically to talk about hemp as an alternative and a legal one, uh, since here in Michigan, uh, it is expected to be a signed law, two laws uh, uh, that are on the governor's desk right now here in Michigan. Uh, governor Snyder is expected to sign a law defining uh, hemp here in Michigan as uh, I believe uh, three-tenths of one percent uh, or below TH THC levels and the other law uh, actually is the, the rest of the, the process of uh, making this legal in Michigan for the first time in, in many decades. Uh, here with me tonight to talk about these many uses of hemp as an alternative and uh, something that people can actually uh, see as an alternative, hopefully by the end of this show, uh, a technology that's been suppressed, but hopefully with these new laws enacted will be suppressed uh, no longer. We have James, who's really the content producer, uh, essentially the reporter for this episode of Oh Say Can You See Tonight. Uh, James Novak, we have uh, uh, Renwick, Renick, um, and your last name? Brutus. Uh, uh, Renick Brutus uh, is here tonight as a guest. And also we have uh, Marta Swain, a uh, local uh, uh, person who actually has a, a store that uh, has a uh, hemp, hempen products, hempen textiles. And uh, she is here to tell us uh, I believe that uh, hemp is not mm -hmm. just some kind of crazy and uh, unattractive burlap. It's actually ordinary, regular clothing, despite perhaps some propaganda that's been out there for, or misconceptions that are out there from whatever source for many years. Uh, and if we could see the graphic, this is actually the, uh, this is our president last year. If we could see that on the overhead, this is quite a, quite a photo here. He's, he's in Michigan. He's with Debbie Stabenow, and he is signing uh, almost a year ago into law the legalization of the widespread growing of industrial hemp here in the United States, which could really be of benefit in a uh, very depressed state like Michigan, especially considering uh, you know, many lost jobs, a state in essentially in depression for decades now, and one where there's a great deal of marginal and uh, abandoned farmland as well. Uh, James, uh, the, you should uh, tell us what you want us to, uh, to know and uh, introduce your guest when it comes to that. Well, thank you, Mark, for having me on the show tonight. It's an honor to be here. I'm the founder of Hemp Solutions. I have uh, dedicated my life to uh, doing things a different route. Uh, my vision is uh, to bring the people together through a grassroots uh, community building venture that actually promotes, uh, promotes the environment, promotes job creation, uh, promotes health, wealth, and jobs. Uh, we have an absolutely amazing opportunity for not only the citizens in Michigan, but for citizens in America across our great nation to literally 
following our founding father's footsteps and to be able to create industry, we have the potential to create hundreds of thousands of jobs across America. We have the ability with just 6% of the usable farmland in America, we could take the entire country off of fossil fuels completely. That is what we're talking about with this crop. We have the ability to be energy independent from fossil fuels completely. We, we, we do not need uh, throwaway materials that are made out of trees. We don't need paper that's made out of trees. We don't need lumber that's made out of trees. We have a sustainable, renewable alternative that is superior to any other plant source out there. And that is a fact. And uh, we have a phone guest that's going to be on the show today uh, joining us from uh, the great state of Texas, uh, fellow hempster and uh, hemp advocate, uh, Derek Cross. Uh, he's going to be joining us on the phone here shortly. Um, uh, so he will be filling us in on some details of why this is important for Michigan. Uh, what this means as far as numbers for the farmers, he's going to go over some numbers uh, uh, just so that farmers can make sense of this. You know, why is this a good crop economically speaking? Uh, what do they stand to benefit? And what are the environmental impacts? So guys, if we can go ahead, uh, if we can welcome Derek Cross on. I, I don't think he's ready. Oh, oh I'm sorry. So I'm here. Oh, he is here. Okay. <clears throat> Hey Derek, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the show, and if you can please uh, help continue on the path here of uh, uh, explaining to the viewers of why this would be a great crop for Michigan. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm I'm honored to be here tonight, and I want to say we have some good things coming into the future of industrial hemp. And in Michigan, I want everybody to know that industrial hemp, by every measure, <coughs> makes more fuel, fiber, food, and medicine than any other plant. And an acre of hemp on an annual basis can produce up to 300 gallons of seed oil for fuel, plastics, and food. Three tons of high protein hemp seed, excuse me, hemp seed meal, 10 tons of bass fiber from canvas, rope, lace, and linen, and about 25 tons of herd fiber for paper and building materials. And from its leaves, we can generate biomass and ethanol for fuel too. So those are some of the reasons that we could start growing and taking advantage of the plant. And the other materials with over 25,000 uses and what we're seeing across the world, we're the only industrialized nation that isn't growing on a large scale. But some of these other countries that are currently growing, the hemp seed can be used for uh, confectionery, beer, flour, feed, dietary fiber, snacks, non-dairy milk and cheese, gluten-free, baking. We can use it for cooking, salad dressing, and dietary supplements. And like I suggested, fuel. And then um, I know your panel has the fabric and clothing industry. And so new in the infant stage, there's so many different avenues anybody can use this plant. The best thing about this plant is that it's a zero waste product. So you can use the whole plant and it does so much for the soil condition. Yeah, it's actually a nitrogen fixer. Uh, it, it actually adds nitrogen to the soil. So assumably, if I understand correctly, you could take uh, what are here in Michigan some marginal soils and it would actually help to build up those soils over time as well as be something that could be grown in, in such conditions uh, that, that might be a bit sandier or drier perhaps. Uh, we were uh, actually uh, hoping that perhaps you could uh, tell us why farmers especially would be interested in, in growing this. Uh, what would it mean to 
say, farmers in Michigan or in Colorado to be able to, to, to grow this uh, as compared to other crops at, the, at this time? Okay, well, for, for example, um, I, I, I couldn't get into all your numbers in Michigan, but I, I can go off of last year's neighboring state of Illinois. Okay. And this is in comparison to an average 1,200 acre farm um, and this is from 2013 statistics out of Illinois for corn and soybean farms. Uh, it usually generates about $146,000 net farm income. So when you divide that out over a 1,200 acre farm, it's about $121 per acre. Now these are, this industrial hemp doesn't need pesticides or herbicides to grow. So you could almost remove that completely out of a farmer's budget. And why why but, doesn't it need uh, herbicides? Is it, uh, it? It's just a natural growing plant. I mean, it, it's been cultivated around the world for over 10,000 years. And it has so many good proper, or qualities about it. Um, it grows so fast that don't need to use any uh, I'm sorry I'm getting a little feedback there but uh, you, you the sound fine at a rapid it? rate the weeds don't have a, a chance to grow so you don't need to oh because it grows so thickly they're shaded out mm -hmm. I'm so sorry what uh, it grows so thickly uh, that it uh, it out competes the weeds apparently correct now this is a dual purpose um, crop so you can grow it primary for fiber, or you can grow it for seed and oil. Um, the oil itself, uh, it can be a, uh, a vehicle fuel, a, uh, a motor fuel? It can, it can be. Um, I mean, you would still have to go through a, a process, a refining process, but we know for a fact that um, the first diesel engine was run on uh, peanut oil, vegetable oil and hemp seed oil. Well, is the, is the hemp seed uh, anywhere nearly as, as polluting as uh, fossil fuels? No. Uh, actually, I know there's some fuel additives made from the hemp, hemp seed oil that, that they're running the, in the diesel engines that actually clean the stack and have improved fuel efficiency. Is it, is it a, essentially a, a very low carbon or no carbon uh, emissions fuel? Well, there are, there are some emissions. Now, you've got to look at how the refining process is involved and what, what, what's done in that. To what process. extent it's refined. But, yeah. but it, it would be basically what the diesel engines are running on. Now you can go and get vegetable oil from the fryers out of McDonald's if you want to throw it into your engine. Well, and I imagine it also has a lot less of a, a carbon uh, footprint because it's not being uh, pulled out of the ground through you know, industrial processes. It's being grown in the ground and actually uh, at the front end is a, is a carbon sink uh, as well. Um, yeah, it, it basically continues that whole loop. So it, what's produced out in the atmosphere the plants are actually reconsuming it as they're growing. So yes, it's actually, uh, Mark, to, to back you up again, and, and we're kind of having a little bit of a problem with the feed there, but uh, the thing is, is it's, it does not contribute to acid rain, does not contribute to global warming. It is actually a superior, uh, it's a biofuel that is good for the environment versus any of the fossil fuels that are obviously going to contribute to glo uh, global warming contribute to acid rain. Um, yes, this isn't going to create the smog that we're all used to seeing with uh, gasoline engines and such, you know. Um, def definitely a much healthier fuel for vehicles. Yeah, and uh, you don't need to destroy entire forests in Canada in order to mine it as rock out of the ground and uh, boil in giant vats the size of football fields and create uh, an extra Los Angeles where there was former <laughs> wilderness in terms of carbon 
footprint. Well, it's it's funny that you, you mentioned the uh, the mining aspect of that. You know, most people think that Canada, when they think of mining, they think, well, the strip mines and things that are going on for the uh, tar sands. You know, right now they're doing a major mining, uh, you know, removing these tar sands, trying to convert them over to a fuel. It's an extremely dirty process. It releases an extreme amount of pollution into the environment, not to mention that it's disrupting and destroying First Nation land, Native American land, sovereign nation land. So now we look at, we look at what else is being mined across Canada and other uh, very, uh, well, these, these are places where wildlife you know, migrates, uh, very wild areas. They're going in and they're actually mining these areas for graphite. Uh, graphite is a material that's found in everyone's pencil. When you write with a pencil, you're writing with graphite. Hemp, uh, well, stepping back for a second, some of you may have heard about uh, the latest, greatest material, the material that's going to bring a technological revolution to the masses. And that is a material called graphene. Graphene is a one layer thick, uh, well, it's a one atom layer of carbon. It's a sheet of carbon. This, this new material stands to make, right out of the gate, computers 10 times faster, solar panels better, uh, cars of the future. We would, we would only dream of having cars this efficient, this green. And the thing is, is hemp graphene, this new uh, carbon sheet material, this nano sheet material made from hemp, it is comparable in all ways, technologically speaking, to graphene, superior in quite a, quite a number of ways. However, we can now produce this graphene-like material from the waste material from hemp hundreds of times cheaper than we can produce it with graphite, which is an ore that must be mined in Canada. We have to go up into these wilderness areas. We have to destroy precious ecosystems to mine this ore that can now be extracted from the waste bast fiber, very small fiber found in the hemp plant. We can now extract those fibers and turn them into carbon nano sheets. We're talking the future of the entire planet, the future of solar panels, computers, the latest, the, the most superior battery technology we've ever dreamed of. Now, speaking to Michigan tonight, we have a $150 million investment, the LG battery factory that went in down in Holland to build the, the best, most green batteries that have ever been designed. This technology coming from this plant now, hemp nanosheets, stands to beat out those technologies and create the new superior battery electrodes the new superior supercapacitors, the future. So we're all without mining. We have a field that heals the air, heals the water, heals the people, creates all of these resources, these raw goods from one single field. This is the opportunity we have all been waiting for. This is the plant and the moment we have all been waiting for. This is economic salvation for Michigan. I mean, 37,000 products from one single plant. Food, fiber, fuel, oil, shelter. You know, we like to say food, clothing, shelter, and love. The basics, the basics that a human needs to survive, it provides it. So with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Mark here. <laughs> oh, well, it seemed to me that you wanted to specifically get into uh, some um, uh, some of the health benefits specifically at about this time. Uh, and also, uh, we were wondering if we could see that great image of the, uh, the hemp seed, if we could, because uh, this seems to be the, the core of the discussion here. If we could get that hemp seed up there, uh, James is going to talk about the health benefits. This is what you expected. Oh, sorry, folks. We're going to go to a quick video here about hemp. Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all grew hemp 
on their private farms. And Jefferson was even quoted once as saying hemp is one of the greatest important substances of our nation. The Declaration of Independence itself was even drafted on paper derived from hemp. So what happened? How did one of the most versatile and adaptable species of crops in the world also become one of the most politically polarizing agricultural resources? Well, in the early 20th century, the plant became labeled a threat so dangerous that it should be wiped out. But it wasn't dangerous to anyone or anything except the industries that it could phase out of existence. So what did the establishment do to ensure their allegiance to the very industries they serve? Well, they did what they do best. They lied and smeared hemp through a propaganda campaign that associated the plant with marijuana. And in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act redefined hemp as a narcotic, which required farmers to obtain a special tax stamp to grow the crop. By 1970, the Controlled Substances Act made growing the crop without a DEA-issued permit strictly illegal. Because of the government crackdown on the crop, it has a negative association. And at this point, you still might be confused because of years of being brainwashed to think that hemp is exactly the same as marijuana, or that its close association with it must classify it as a drug. But this couldn't be farther from the truth. Just check out the Congressional Research Service report on hemp that states, quote, although marijuana is also a variety of cannabis, it is genetically distinct from industrial hemp, and it is further distinguished by its use and chemical makeup. So, hemp is genetically distinct from the drug, marijuana. In fact, if you smoked an entire garbage bag full of hemp, you wouldn't get high. Yet the plant remains illegal under U.S. federal law. And like I said before, not because it's a danger to people, but because it's a danger to corporations. In the early 20th century, hemp competed heavily with the cotton and paper industry. Because paper made from trees had to compete against environmentally friendly hemp products, the paper industry was at risk to suffer. So William Hearst, a New York State congressman and one of the biggest newspaper publishers in America, launched a campaign against hemp. He used his publication to smear the public's perception of the crop, which at the same time was threatening his successful paper company. In fact, this very campaign is where the term yellow journalism derived from. But this was in the 1920s. How is the propaganda still working today? Because the threat hemp poses isn't limited to paper. Reviving the industry could potentially devastate the profits of huge corporations that manufacture lumber, fossil fuels, steel, alcohol, and even food, among many other things, including this. In 1941, Henry Ford even built a car made almost entirely from hemp. The frame of the car was 12 times lighter than steel and 10 times stronger. Not only that, but the car was powered by hemp seed oil. Do I even have to explain the threat that this technology would pose to giant oil companies? Process hemp also creates one of the strongest fibers we know of, providing all natural materials to build homes, ships, trains, planes, and automobiles, and practically indestructible clothing. Furthermore, hemp seed oil can be made into lotions and skin creams. The practical applications for this plant are limitless, and the reason it remains illegal is simple. It's just one giant push to preserve the profits of corporations that poison our planet, destroy our forests, and bankrupt the world. But this all could change if recent efforts in Kentucky are an indication, and if moves by a few key members in the U.S. Senate succeed, hemp could soon be removed from the government's list of Schedule I controlled substances. The hemp industry could very well be revived back to being America's number one cash crop. And that's one step closer to succeeding against a model of profit, greed, and control that sadly defines this country today. Well, that was RT, and uh, this is OSEC NUC, and that was uh, RT uh, in a can for you, uh, and they were talking about what we're talking about. and. So uh, we are here for just a moment uh, while we prepare to go right into uh, our little bit of the Ford car that's coming up here. We have, uh, we have another roll-in of the Ford car. Are we ready? Okay. Are we ready with the Ford car roll-in? This thing was made of hemp plastic, as she said, almost entirely made of hemp. We have uh, some footage of an axe being wielded at this thing, and it's not leaving scratches on it. Just try doing that to your, uh, <laughs> to your
to your car, whatever it's made of from today, and this thing is far lighter uh, than conventional cars, uh, and the material is far, far stronger, and it's made from hemp. Okay, here we go. Amongst the thousands of products made from hemp, one of the most extraordinary is Henry Ford's plastic car. Built in 1941, it contained cellulose fibers derived from hemp, sisal, and wheat straw. The plastic was lighter than steel, yet could withstand ten times the impact without denting. Just uh, an amazingly bizarre thing, but true. And uh, as we've often discussed, uh, technologies become sequestered. Uh, people believe that they never existed, and, and yet they have existed uh, in the not-so-distant past. There are alternatives, despite what people say, and the planet can be saved. And here in Michigan, we could even save jobs by uh, involving ourselves more with hemp and buying hemp and products, I'm sure. Uh, we have actually, if, uh, if James wants to, he could uh, let us know something about uh, hemp construction before our next roll-in. But uh, if we could prepare that roll-in, we could run into it uh, any time. This is, uh, is this the hempcrete? Oh, uh, yes, up? yeah. And uh, what's this from, James? So uh, first, before we go to the roll-in, I'd like to go ahead and show you oh, guys. Oh, he's going to demonstrate. Um, just so you can see uh, some of the construction applications, we're going to have a video to explain the construction applications in a little more detail. However, uh, here, uh, for demonstration purposes, we have an actual industrial hemp stalk. And the end of this, which this has, this has a, it's a seasonal crop. It can be grown in, in literally less than 100 days from seed, seed to harvest. This is one of the strongest natural fibers, second only to uh, spider silk on the planet. So this is the stalk that will make the house of the future. This is a house, well, this is the material, this is hempcrete that some of you may or may not have heard of. Hempcrete is uh, lighter and stronger than concrete. Uh, it has superior uh, acoustic properties and it also has superior insulating properties. Uh, what this also does is this is... How is it that it has superior insulating properties? We're not sure if we can get <coughs> well, our the, roll uh, in, but uh, so you might have to demonstrate The cellulose-rich uh, pulp of this herd, to make this block, we chip this up. We take this, we take the, the shiv is what it's called, the uh, pulp material, it's shredded up, it's mixed with lime. It is uh, lime and sand in this mixture uh, to create this building uh, material you see here. Uh, fireproof, uh, mold, mold proof, uh, rot resistant, everything. I'd say it's rot proof really because it's gonna last for in upwards of hundreds to thousands of years. It actually creates a petrified wall system. Um, this can be poured into an upwards of 16 inch thick walls, which will create an R60 or better value. We're talking about a house that would have such high insulating properties that it would require practically no heating or energy cost. Uh, uh, to, you know, we're talking about uh, a material that uh, you're going to be able to drastically lower uh, your heating and cooling costs. Um, it's going to make a healthy wall system. They call it a breathable wall system. Uh, basically, uh, the more you research into this, the more you'll find that this is the building material of the future. This is the, the when you have a choice in building material, this is, this is the one to go with. And with that said, we're gonna go ahead and roll into our, uh, our video here of the <laughs> hemp construction. Well, if, we have our if, we, if that video is, if it's just a question of it's, it's not working so well, if it works even as well as the last, no, it won't. Okay, we don't have it, but we do still have Eric, I mean, Derek uh, on the line. Derek Cross yeah. from Colorado. Sorry, Derek, hey, how you doing? I'm doing terrific, thank you. I also want to include when this plant grows that it actually um, eats, it, I, I'm sorry, the, it sequesters the carbon as it's growing. So that's how this helps eat the carbon out of the atmosphere. And then we also have the root structure that is an uh, excellent phytoremediator. 
and it also helps our soil condition from erosion and it it, it can produce up four times more paper pulp than tree, one acre. And when we're looking at comparison, how much more oxygen it can produce, um, we need to leave the big giants in the ground and let the crop grow it, mow it, regrow it. It's a sustainable, renewable resource. Yeah. And you can grow it in different regions, maybe two crops a year. There, there's so much that we can do with this. Well, uh, it's an interesting point. Uh, by uh, using hemp to get paper fiber and leaving forests intact, that alone uh, would have a, a great uh, uh, positive impact on the uh, carbon sink situation, meaning that the more carbon stays in the earth rather than comes out of it. And, and that home that James is talking about building, if you're going to use a radiant floor method done by a boiler system, guess what? We can use this as a fuel. We can, we can grow this with other grasses and other materials and make fuel pellets from this. And guess what? We just reduced our, our, our demand on you know, fossil fuels even that much more. Um, when, you can, when you can create plastics that are able to be returned back to the soil, uh, this oil that's crushed, uh, my whole plight started because I could apply it directly to my skin for my eczema. Then I started wondering what more could this plant do? And then when I researched, I just kept going and research and research. And now look at, I'm a hemp farmer in Colorado. I have a couple of businesses. I, I, I know this is a public show and I'm not trying to put my name out there, but I have a couple of businesses that I'm involved in. There are over 200 other businesses here in the United States. And I don't want to confuse your audience by any means, but the medicinal cannabis in Colorado has provided 10,000 jobs. So let's look at what this plant can produce in, in jobs and, and then clean living and building a home that doesn't off gas. We can put this in oil. All this oil can go into plastics, decompostable, non-toxic plastics. That same oil can make fuels refined into jet fuel still. So all these diesel motors that are running out there, it doesn't take much to make a switch to this. We have the technology to do that. So whether it's our homes and, and everything that's produced pollution into the environment, our skin is the largest organ of our body. It breathes just like a sponge. What we put on our skin goes into our skin. I don't use any other product other than hemp soaps, hemp lotions, and uh, that's what I use on my skin, and it heals my eczema. It can heal psoriasis, and I know there's other medicinal forms that can heal cancers. So we have to take a look at what we're doing at, from an environmental standpoint, where all of our, um, all these carcinogens compiled onto an individual. Why do we have a cancer epidemic? I don't want to get into a debate. Oh, yeah, saying, yeah, definitely. I want yeah. to change our atmosphere. I want to change the off-gassing of homes. When, we're, when I can take this fiber and make an insulation that I can literally put up to my face and breathe it, I can't do that with the other kind of stuff, and I'm not mentioning any names. I'm just saying. We, we, we the people, need to make this change. Yeah. Our forefathers knew it. And this is, I don't go dwell in the past, but I look at our future. And some of the things that James just pointed out about the uh, hemp graphene, that's an amazing innovation. Well, uh, hemp as a natural product, uh, I mean, its impact to, uh, compared to something that is artificially and destructively uh, mined out of the earth itself, uh, that's an obvious benefit. Uh, the benefits are, uh, you know, for the consumer, for the environment, uh, 
And uh, we also, of course, have the, the fiber as a, as a clothing material. And we're here tonight to discuss that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and if uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Marta, our clothing and textiles expert. She's and, a local uh, uh, vendor of these sorts of hemp and textiles, and uh, she's here to describe these. Uh, and and, yeah. Marta, if I could for a second, if I could show the, uh, demonstrate with this uh, piece of uh, hemp stalk here. Now, Marta, Marta is an expert in the textiles and clothing industry and they get their fiber from this plant and this plant which i can barely break you can see the fiber this yeah, is we... usable fiber we can throw this through a machine we can use this fiber to create on this this pulp as well paper plastics textiles there's over 5,000 textile uses alone and that's quoting a 1938 popular mechanics Two, there's 25,000 uses and 5,000 textile uses alone. So as you can see, here's the fiber. Yeah, it uh, right off, and you can't quite see it, perhaps with the camera. What so we're doing with the this, camera right now, but there are these fine hair-like fibers that are clearly visible from where I'm sitting. This is how I'd like to go ahead and cue up uh, Marta to go ahead and discuss how this fiber is turned into one of the healthiest fibers for our bodies. So, Marta. That stuff looks pretty rough, <laughs> and that's part, uh, a large part of the problem, I think, that people's misconceptions about things they don't know, and hemp is probably one of the least understood elements in our world, and I discovered it when I learned that cotton, sold as the fabric of your life, was actually the most heavily treated crop in the world with carcinogenic chemicals and pesticides. And it had been that for several decades while we were all one person away from breast cancer and it seemed absurd that the species with the largest brain would allow that to be bought and sold as such. So I decided at that point I would never invest, I couldn't ever justify spending another dollar on cotton a fiber that I'd actually come to enjoy over the course of my life. But then I had to address the question of what was I going to wear. So I started doing some research into things that, did, that were reasonable alternatives, healthier alternatives, and came up uh, most impressed with hemp, a, a, a resource that grows without the use of chemicals, pesticides, or irrigation with a tap root that holds it to the ground beyond um, what any other plant we had ever, that every other plant, that uh, every other crop is wiped out by hurricanes when that plant is able to hold on. As they said, it grows like a weed, so the leaves shade out the, uh, the, the plants, the plant shades out weeds, and is, it's all set up for success and sustainability in a way that the sustainability movement still uh, has yet, I guess, to realize. So we, uh, I say we because it always has been we. It's been the people who responded to uh, my decision to take $400 and invest it into the nicest clothing that I could find and then start learning from others about how good clothing gets. So that stock is, is maybe a far cry from this hemp silk <clears throat> that I'm, I'm dressed in items right now that is an homage to people who have come and gone throughout the industry after devoting their lives to producing beautiful things that the world didn't quite get. And if the world doesn't get what you're doing in time, you don't get to do it long. So. Um, I'm, I've been honored to work with uh, over 100 designers, partnering with them, um, local designers, regional, domestic, and international designers, all committed to practices that prevent pollution and conserve resources and promote social justice. So it's been an absolute gratified pleasure to offer up that 
on an ethical basis, but also to find out, to help people discover how comfortable clothing can be and how one piece of clothing can take the place of two, three, four, or more and please you through the seasons and look, fab look and feel fabulous. So um, we have some, we have some uh, models here tonight, my, some of my <coughs> fellow crew members at Clothing Matters. Danielle is wearing a, a, a jacket designed and handmade by one of our longest running Michigan design partners. She's wearing a patchwork zero waist scarf that is by, an, by yet another Michigan design partner. And she's wearing her, one of our best selling skirts of 18 years. This was 18 years ago. In 1996 is when I discovered that cotton was, should be out of the picture and there had to be better alternatives. So, um, and Danielle is wearing, I believe, a hemp and, yeah, uh, hemp and organic cotton, is it, Glenn? Mm -hmm. And a hemp and organic cotton skirt and leggings. So she's head to toe in the good stuff. And once we get there, there's no going back. And that's how we happen to have still been in business uh, 18, uh, going on 19 years later because of people, a very diverse and discerning clientele of people who appreciate nicer things and want to feel good about what their dollars are doing and not investing in the insidious petrochemical wasteland problems that, uh, that have gone beyond tower tolerance. throughout the seasons. Yep. Absolutely, four Anti seasons. Antimicrobial. Antimicrobial, antibacterial. Um, hemp, hemp needs very little of what uh, other clothing may need and have been treated with. Actually, cotton, conventionally grown cotton, that you see on the rack at any store out there has been through five carcinogenic treatments, um, including bleach and heavy metal dyes and um, sizing. Erin is, is having fun showing her, well, I'm, I'm having fun watching her show a, a, a piece that serves as a dress and a skirt that's made of hemp and organic cotton. It's actually clay dyed and hand sewn in Alabama. The, the jacket she's wearing is made of hemp and organic cotton, as is the uh, shirt underneath. And um, I'm going to quickly show a couple of others. This is, if we could, we wish that you could feel the difference, but since you can't on television, we, we brought some examples just to show of a variety of weights and blends of a 55-45, a hemp and organic cotton fiber. Um, I don't know how well the black will show up, but we have uh, several of our partners represented here. And uh, some slight versions of a best-selling skirt that has pleased so many people. This is a beautiful hemp and organic cotton skirt that can also be used as a dress. And let's see. Some fun colors. Again, fiber active, non-invasive, non non-toxic non dyes are, what is, are, are one of the details that we insist upon. Um, this is, a, this is a, lo a, not a local designer, Conscious Clothing, out of, out of Rockford, where Rose is one of our longest running Michigan design partners. And, oops, let's see. Am I, am I still working? Is it still working, guys? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, some, <laughs> some fun tie-dye, vertebra-looking pattern on a hemp and organic cotton skirt. Locally dyed uh, infinity scarf by Danielle. And this is a hemp and organic cotton tee, similar to what you'd see in mainstream, as, as you can notice, but far more desirable for reasons that have to do with lowering the toxic, the generation of toxins in the environment. We live in an ecosystem, so we really like knowing that our clothing choices are not poisoning our planet and coming home to us, into our closets, 
onto our bodies and uh, not, not, cutting, not cutting much break. Here's a little onesie made of organic cotton and hemp. This is, uh, this is another clay dyed and hand sewn in Alabama by Earth Creations. All of these different items are fun examples of, we even have some locally hand painted hemp jackets here by, by uh, our, friend, our partner Joe Sherry. Here's a gorgeous, here's a testament to uh, some of, this is a hemp and yak suit. Hemp and yak, so that's hemp and wool that uh, is by one of our partners who have come and you gone. Not everyone can wait for the world to wake up and we feel like we're very fortunate to have still been here and supported by amazing clientele people. Yeah. Some who travel from five hours away and some who happen to just walk in and discover us and give us the opportunity of learning from them about what they think of how good clothing gets. Well, Marta, if you could do us a favor, uh, we're a little, little limited on time here. We have a few uh, people that probably would like to call in in the next few minutes. However, we have our guest here, uh, Renick, and if you can please help us introduce. to introduce, yes, Thank introduce you. Renick for us. My friend Renick is here because of, um, I thought his input, uh, he, he works locally with a lot of different people on economic development that is ethically based. and. Um, I'm honored to have his interest in our business, and I just thought it would be great to have his input from someone from someone in the community who is who is tied in and and learning great things. Thank you, Martha. So my my background is of uh, on, on account of having been trained as an economist, and in particular uh, focusing on economic development. So such concepts as uh, import substitution. Um, which means rather than import things that you don't have in an environment or community, look around for the things that you do have and then, and then develop them so that you could uh, sustain the local population and ultimately generate income and create wealth. Mm -hmm. the, the alternative is to then go beyond that to export promotion. That is to share it where it's desired elsewhere. And, and that, that's fundamental for any community um, that, that seeks to thrive. So when we look at Michigan as an example, um, over the last decade, there's been this idea of out-migration, a loss of jobs due to the collapse of established industries as people pursue jobs elsewhere. Well, when, when one looks at the, a, a basic principle for retaining jobs and or for creating income and ultimately wealth that's sustainable, one should look for the resources that exist. And in the conversation we've been having tonight, um, there's two basic elements that could converge intelligently to create that economic development. One being the land the land that, that could, could be used to then grow what is an intelligent crop that has multiple uses. Therefore, unless one can make a very strong case for how it's problematic, there is every reason to look at the benefits that could be derived, to manage the asset, to contain any of the risks that might be associated otherwise, and to deploy the labor, the technology, and the resources to intelligently produce something that will benefit the community, in this case the state, and then beyond that, export it to improve lives elsewhere and generate income and wealth. There's a logic that flows naturally um, on, a, on account of using some fundamental economic principles bundled with the utility of a product, in this case hemp, and creating wealth, jobs, for a sustainable, thriving Michigan economy. Uh, well, we're open for a call. I, I think that we probably have enough time for one or two calls. Uh, and, in, and so if you call 459-4881, uh, this is live. This is 
uh, January 7th. This is Osei Can You See? And uh, I've been here with uh, James, who's been one of our crew people, and with a couple guests. Uh, and uh, James, while we're waiting for a call, uh, it's, it's your, your production, really. So tell us what you well, want us to uh, hear now. We're limited to the last few minutes here. So um, I just would like to go ahead and, again, reach out to the Michigan, uh, the Michigan public. We need to have an open forum on this. We need to come together. We need to do everything we can to get this crop in our soil as quickly as possible. Jobs, health, and wealth. This country needs to have this industry. This, this, this country needs this, uh, but more importantly, our state needs these jobs. You know, and we have a rich history in America with this crop. So again, like I said, with all of the uses, with all of the benefits, uh, we really need to come together as a people and we need to right the wrongs. We need to step forward together with something that's going to work. It's gonna work economically and environmentally. And with that, I will go ahead and close. Um, so. I, I think that we, we still do have time. Uh, and I, I think it's important for people to uh, realize that uh, this is a, uh, an action that can be taken. And it's an amazing thing that to see the legislature of Michigan, which is even uh, dominated by the Republicans, uh, going ahead for apparent uh, economic sense reasons, uh, endorsing hemp as a product here in Michigan, which is, is amazing considering all these uh, decades of the suppression of this material and this technology. Uh, it, that alone is kind of a hopeful sign that I didn't expect to see. And I've heard nothing about this in the, in the major media. Uh, and so this is, is remarkable. And people should take advantage of it and realize that uh, this is potentially a real opening for something different. And it may mean that uh, people, even people that you might consider to be unfriendly, nasty sorts of people, like maybe Republicans, uh, are actually shaking off uh, some of the, the corporate uh, you know, sleeping powder that's been spread over them for so many years. And uh, this has been Osei Can You See? And, uh, this is CTV, is the producer also known as the Society for Economic Equality. And you still could call into this show because we still actually have four minutes left and we've essentially wrapped up already. And so <laughs> we have, um, we have some more uh, couple comments, other models. I suppose. Oh, um, yeah. If they want to come out. While they're coming out, we would like to go ahead and again thank our, our phone <coughs> guest, Derek Cross, who uh, oh I'm sure may still be on the line. Derek, thank yes, you again for being on the show. Thank you. Can I, can I put one second in? Sure. Okay, I touched on the numbers in the neighboring state of Illinois for corn and beans, but I forgot to project on that 1,200-acre farm that, that yields about $146,000 of net income that is $121 per acre. And the lowest numbers out of Canada are about $200 an acre. So multiply that times 1,200, and that's a $94,000 increase at the extreme low end. Well, thank now, you. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. And uh, back to you, you. Uh, James, and uh, to uh, Marta. Uh, what are we seeing as we go out here? Uh, a couple anything fabulous different? models just showing the, the more fun that we can get out of uh, styles that go this way and that way, dress up and down. and. Um, through the seasons and the button front column dress actually made of 100% hemp, part of a vintage collection that we're proud to have. The gentlemen here are in, pan, uh, in, in shirts made of hemp and organic cotton and pants made of hemp and recycled PET. Only parts of the solution are, are, are serving us as well as they have and we're honored to be in them, honored to be part of it and absolutely hopeful about the intelligence going forward. And uh, this has been Osei Can You See? And uh, as I said, product <laughs> of, uh, produced by the Society for Economic Equality, also 
this show, the series is Oh Say Can You See. It reruns every Tuesday from 6 to 7. And uh, it's live on the first, the third, and the fifth Wednesday of every month. And, uh, and uh, we have. Mark, if I could go yep. ahead and add to for the viewers, we don't have a link up right this second. However, uh, if you would like any more information about hemp, hemp farming, hemp health, any of these aspects, we're a nonprofit organization listed on uh, Facebook and the web. You can reach us at hemp-solutions.org. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. We've got a farming tab on the top menu bar of our site. You can go ahead and click on that. Uh, learn the state laws. Uh, there's links on there to the state agricultural department, and there's also links on there to the state legislative page to get in touch with uh, how the laws are progressing. So, website is your website up? And um, again, guys, that is hemp-solutions.org. You can find us on Facebook at Hemp Solutions USA. Well, uh, go hemp. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone that was on the show today. Thank you for the models, Marta, Rennick, and Mark, for having us all on the show. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing hemp fields across uh, Michigan. We look forward to jobs and all of the health and wealth that this plant will provide. Good work. Oh, good work uh, from our models and from our guests. and. Uh, from our uh, content producer tonight, James Novak. Uh, I'm Mark Sapatowski. Again, it's been Oak Say Can You See, and hopefully we will be back in two weeks with another exciting episode of Oak Say Can You See and CTV. And, uh, thank you for watching. And that's, I guess that's it pretty much. Oh, and uh, thank you for our models.